You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the Rand Corporation. I'm Deanna Lee. And I'm Evan Banks. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from Rand's latest research and commentary. It's June 2nd. What do America's teachers think about school safety generally? And how do they feel about specific proposals, such as policies that would allow teachers to carry firearms at school? We surveyed nearly 1,000 K-12 teachers to find out. Here's an overview of our results. Teachers are divided on whether arming themselves would make schools safer. 54% feel that teachers carrying guns would make schools less safe. 20% feel it would make schools safer, and 26% feel it would make schools neither more nor less safe. About one in five teachers we surveyed said they would be interested in carrying a gun to school if allowed. All told, this means about 550,000 of the country's 3 million K-12 teachers would choose to carry a firearm at school if allowed. White teachers were more likely than black teachers to feel that teachers carrying firearms would make schools safer. And male teachers in rural schools were most likely to say that they would personally carry a firearm at school if allowed. Despite the growth in gun violence, bullying, not active shooters, was teachers' most common safety concern, followed by fights and drugs. Roughly half of teachers felt that physical security measures at their school, such as ID badges, cameras, and security staff, positively affected the school climate. Only 5% of teachers felt that these measures had a negative impact on school climate. Based on these survey results, RAND experts suggest several areas for deeper research. One is developing better approaches for school safety that could help balance efforts to respond to and prevent the frequent lower-level forms of school violence, such as bullying, with efforts aimed at lower-probability, extreme forms of violence, like shootings. You can find the full report at rand.org. After months of lobbying by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, the West appears ready to provide Ukraine with U.S.-made F-16 fighter jets. The aircraft could come from several different NATO countries, most likely the Netherlands, Denmark, and Norway, all of which have recently retired F-16s in their fleets. Even though President Biden recently said that the U.S. would support training Ukrainian pilots to fly the F-16s, Rand's Bryn Tannehill, a former naval aviator, explains that there are still many obstacles related to operating, maintaining, and sustaining the aircraft. Many of the challenges relate to the supply chain for F-16s, acquiring sufficient spare parts, funding for operations and support, training maintenance teams, and acquiring an ongoing supply of weapons to arm the aircraft. In other words, the situation is far more complicated than simply training Ukrainian pilots and delivering a handful of well-used F-16s. Tannehill also notes that even with adequate supply and maintenance, the F-16 isn't plug-and-play. Like any complex weapon system, it was designed to fill a particular set of roles within an existing military structure with a unique doctrine and culture. In this case, the F-16 was designed to help the U.S. Air Force beat the Russian Air Force. So the more the Ukrainians can fly them like the U.S. Air Force would, the better. Overall, it seems highly unlikely that F-16s will change the balance on the battlefield anytime soon, Tannehill says. The airspace over Ukraine will remain contested, and Ukraine's ground forces will still need to rely on Ukraine's existing air platforms for support. But just because the F-16s aren't a wonder weapon doesn't mean they won't make a difference. The aircraft will help Kyiv defend its territory more efficiently, and might even help end the war, she says. Quote, Unlike the previous provisions of anti-tank missiles, artillery, armored vehicles, and air defenses, the decision to give Ukraine F-16s is not about helping it survive the next phase of the war, but helping it ensure its sovereignty in the long term. If you were to pay a company like SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, or Boeing to go into space, perhaps even perform your own spacewalk, 
Should those companies be bound by safety regulations set by the Federal Aviation Administration? Currently, the answer is no, thanks to a law that bans federal regulation of commercial space enterprises. Without federal requirements, companies that offer commercial spaceflight services voluntarily determine and choose to apply safety standards that they deem appropriate. Such standards include basic critical safety aspects like when passengers should be strapped into the vehicle's cabin, when they should wear pressurized suits in case of a loss of oxygen, and what risk tolerance for serious injury or death they might encounter. Further, these companies are not required to share their safety data and information publicly, including incidents or anomalies that may indicate risk. According to RAND experts, the current system has created a dearth of data and a lack of transparency about the safety of commercial spaceflight. It's time to change this, they say, by allowing the FAA to lead the creation of safety standards. If the status quo continues, it could lead to gaps or blind spots that increase the likelihood of a catastrophic event in space. As the U.S. military increasingly focuses on China, it is important to understand how Beijing's approach to psychological warfare is evolving and what it might mean for Chinese strategic behavior in a potential crisis or conflict. A new RAND report finds that China is leveraging a variety of technologies to improve its psychological warfare capabilities, including advanced computing, brain science, and brain imaging, laser weapons, sonic weapons, subliminal messaging, and holograms. In fact, there is strong evidence that the Chinese military has developed and employed information manipulation capabilities and laser weapons already, although it is unclear whether these have been specifically intended as psychological warfare. The authors of the report consider a hypothetical case study to show how China's next-generation psychological warfare capabilities could play out in a future U.S.-China contingency. One high-risk future scenario they explore involves Chinese leaders believing that emerging technologies will enable China to predict or influence adversary decision-making. This could lead Beijing to have misplaced confidence in its ability to deter or coerce adversaries from fighting. The authors also offer some recommendations for the U.S. Department of Defense. For example, DOD should consider how to protect its troops from Chinese information collection and information manipulation, and pay special attention to an increase in intelligence deception from China. The Pentagon should also consider engaging in dialogue with China, specifically the Chinese military, on the implications of new technology for warfare. Four decades ago, Leonid Brezhnev led the USSR into what many Soviets called the era of stagnation. Today, Vladimir Putin is taking Russia down a similar path, say RAND experts. They recently broke down the parallels between these two leaders. To start, both Brezhnev and Putin have waged wars against neighbors, turning their countries into outcasts and inflaming ties with the West. And both have consistently repressed dissidents and oppositionists. Although living standards increased under both leaders initially, the Brezhnev era came to be dogged by food shortages and lines for consumer goods. Today, while many Russians still feel confident about their economic future, Putin's Kremlin may be unable to sustain its high war spending and social payments. Finally, public morale declined under both leaders. Support for Soviet rule eroded after Brezhnev's economic promises went unfulfilled. And many Russian citizens today are outraged over corruption in the Putin regime. And there is growing concern about the war in Ukraine. Taken together, these issues hint that Putin's presidency is at risk of spiraling downward, as did Brezhnev's. For Ukraine and the West, this means there may be hope that Russia will lose the war in Ukraine or someday dial down its hostile stance. Quote, Putin's policies profoundly alienate Russia from the West and propel Ukraine even faster toward a European and Euro-Atlantic future. But 
This process could be unpredictable or take time. That's it for today's episode. You can learn more about the topics we discussed in the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis.